turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 25 through to the end. Do not worry. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Uh, we're going to split this into two um, sermons, so you'll bear with me as we get through the first one this morning, um, and we'll pick it up with the rest next week. Why don't you join with me as we pray? Our Father, you are a God who has revealed himself to us, not in some obscure way, but in a very demonstrable way, by coming down from heaven into this world in the form of a man and living amongst us and showing who you are, not only through the words that you spoke, but through the actions that you committed yourself to. And we thank you that when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the Father, we see God in the flesh. And we thank you that his life has been written down for us, not by authors that simply recorded some facts, but rather through the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon all of those authors, and so superimposing himself that while he did not in any sense curb the style of the writer, he ensured that the words they wrote were the words that you wanted them to write. And so we thank you that we have in your word the word of God, and we thank you that it is a living word, sharper than any double-edged sword. We thank you that it is a word that continues to have relevance for us today. And we thank you that it is a word that declares your greatness and reveals Christ. And so we pray this morning that your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, might do its work in our hearts for the glory of your great name and for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For several years, a woman having 
had a lot of trouble to sleep at night because she feared burglars. Now, why do you lock your door at night if you don't fear getting robbed or if you don't fear someone breaking in? One night, her husband heard a noise in the house, so he went downstairs to investigate. I don't know if I'd want to go and investigate without a baseball bat. When he got there, he did find a burglar. Good evening, said the man of the house. I'm pleased to see you. Come upstairs and meet my wife. She's been waiting 10 years for you to meet her. <laughs> yeah, we can have a bit of a laugh of that. But you know, the truth is, we all worry. Who here has never worried ever in their life? If you can raise your hand, because I just want to discover who the liars are in the church, then raise your hand. <laughs> The fact is we all worry, don't we? We get anxious about different things. And depending on your temperament type, some of us are more prone to worry than others. Not so. I mean, all of you have met those anxious people that, for whatever reason, just get anxious about a lot of things. Now, I'm not saying that in any sense in a condemnatory way because the reality is God has created us differently. And we have different temperaments. And some of us are just that way inclined, and others just are carefree, worry free, and just get on with life. And, you know, if something goes wrong and they lose a hand, they say, oh, well, I've lost my hand, I've got another one. You know, and they don't, they don't seem to worry about things, and they breeze through life. But for many others, there are things that concern them. Am I going to have a job that will sustain me? What about coronavirus? I mean, there's been two years' worth of fear and concern, hasn't there? We've gone around wearing masks. We've self-isolated. We've been careful about keeping our social distancing. We've been vaccinated to protect us. and we, We've gone through all kinds of measures because we worried about it. My wife is immunocompromised, is sitting at home, not watching because we've stopped our live stream, but she's sitting at home because... If she comes and she gets a cold or she gets something, it's going to put her immune system under pressure. And so there, there are things that we worry about, we concern ourselves about. And then Jesus comes along and he cuts across all of that and he says, don't worry. And it's almost as if these words kind of jar us, don't they? I mean, there's a sense in which we want to say, Jesus, how can you say to us, don't worry? Don't you realize the, the kinds of things we engage in in this world? Don't you realize the kind of pressures we face? Don't you realize the kind of frailties that is bound up in your humanity? And, and here you come along and you say, don't worry. It's counterintuitive. Now the point when Jesus talks about not worrying is, is there's a sense in which it's, it's not so much that we're not going to worry as it is don't. Keep on fretting. And so he gives this firstly reassuring proclamation, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life or about what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Now for us to understand rightly here, I think it's worth just trying to remember when Jesus speaks about worry. It's not that Jesus is condemning that the, the fact that from time to time you and I might worry because that is part of the human condition. Now, unfortunately, I can't really uh, bring this out illustratively in, in, a, in a more helpful way, but the Afrikaans people in South Africa have a saying. It says, Muni di bobian achter di berg gaan suk. Now, I'll translate that I've spoken in tongues, I know, and I'm going to bring translation. It's just hard to translate it in a way that will bring out its meaning. It's, it's saying, don't go and look for the baboon behind the mountain. In other words, don't go looking to keep on worrying. Don't seek anxiety out. 
Don't make every effort to try and worry about things. And, and there's a lot of sense in that. And Jesus is trying to turn our attention away from ourselves and turn it back onto God and is trying to help us to say, yes, I understand there's all these things that cause concern, but you're actually much more important than the things that cause you concern. Now, the disciples, remember the context, the disciples have just been told, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths come in and rust and, and decay, but rather store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Now, they are Jesus' itinerant preachers. What's the next thing they're going to do? They're going to be sent out and they're going to preach. Now, Jesus has just said to them, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now the question is, well, okay, but we have to go out and preach. Who's going to sustain us? If our work is bound up with proclamation of the gospel, how are we going to survive? And so Jesus says to them within that context, don't worry about food and clothes and those things that are the basic necessities of life because at the end of the day, God is over all of that. God has got all of that covered. And so he says to them, literally, when he says, do not be anxious, if you were to bring out the, the way in which it comes out in the original language, Jesus is saying, stop worrying yesterday, and never take it up again. Those are really strong, powerful words. Now, from a human perspective, that is exceptionally difficult for us because we live in such a frail, broken world, and we experience the effects of that brokenness in our lives daily, don't we? And so there are all kinds of things that swirl around in our minds that might cause us to want to worry. But Jesus is saying, don't allow yourself to become consumed with those things. You as a Christian, don't live in fear, live in faith. That is not to say there are not things out there that may still cause you to fear, but don't allow those things to overwhelm you. Don't allow those things to cause you to become preoccupied with them. Rather, remember that God, who looks after you, who cares for you, has got all those things covered. God has it under control. Notice uh, when he says, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Jesus is bringing the force to bear on us that our lives are far more important than these necessities. Yes, we need them to sustain us. And the implication is obvious, is it not? Jesus is concerned about your life. Jesus is engaged in your life. Jesus is watching over you. He sees what happens. He understands your anxieties. He knows your heart. He knows the fretting that goes on in your mind sometimes. Make no mistake about that. And God reassures through Christ that he's over all of that stuff. Psalm chapter 24 verse 1 makes this simple declaration. The earth is Yahweh's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Or 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Yahweh, is the kingdom. 
you are exalted as head over all. It's a graphic reminder that God is over all. And God is in control. And God does own everything. And so whatever you and I possess ultimately is a gift from God because he owns it anyway. And all the resources in the world are God's resources. And knowing that or having a knowledge of that should encourage us to be able to put two and two together and work out in our minds if God owns everything and if God is over everything, then he is more than capable of meeting all of my needs. John Wesley, it's a quite a humorous story. When he was away from home, someone came running up to him crying, your house has burned down. Your house has burned down. To which Wesley replied, no, it hasn't, because I don't own a house. The one I have been living in belongs to the Lord. And if it has burned down, that is one less responsibility for me to worry about. <laughs> it's a great way of looking at it, isn't it? One less responsibility to worry about. So can I remind you this morning of what hopefully you already know. That God has got your life in the palm of his hand. He's got you. He knows the things that are on your mind because he sees everything and he knows everything. He understands the heart that becomes troubled over the many perplexities in life, the many difficulties we face. He knows when you fear the future or you fear the present, he's got all of that in hand. We used to sing a song and I looked it up on the internet. It's very hard to find. Some of you more mature people might recognize it. Some of you younger people won't know what I'm talking about. It goes, I've just got to, I, 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 I need to sing it because if I sing it, I'll remember the words. But I better not sing it. <laughs> Why worry when you can pray? Why worry Jesus is your stay? Don't be a doubting Thomas. Just rest upon his promise. Why worry, 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 worry when you can pray? Secondly, the Father's generous provision. Look at verses 26 to 32. The Father's generous provision. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So he gives three illustrations. Let's take them one, one by one and, and briefly. The first is he deals with how God feeds the birds. Now, when you think about that, the birds don't have storage facilities. They are day-to-day -day dependent upon whatever food they can find. Now, as Martin Luther once famously said, God does not drop the worms into the birds' mouths. They have to go looking for their food. So this is not a call to passivity. This is not a call to sit back and say, well, you know, I don't have to work. I can just sit back and God's going to provide and I don't have to do anything about that because, you know, God has said I'm more valuable than the birds and he feeds the birds, so here comes the food. And sit at home all day doing nothing. That's not what he's saying. We are told repeatedly in Proverbs that the lazy man who finds it too difficult to even bring the spoon to his mouth, well, he's going to end up going without and so this is not a point about not working, but it is the point that is being made is that these birds are dependent upon God day by day, not looking at the future, not storing up things. When you go home today, you've got stuff in your fridge, haven't you? You've got stuff in your freezer. Why have you got it there? Because at some future point, date and time, you're going to use that stuff and you're going to eat it and unfreeze it and cook it. 
The birds don't have such luxuries. Well, mind you, having said that, Janice feeds some birds in our house so they know where to get their food every day. And one day when I was sitting there uh, talking to Janice in the dining room, we heard this bang. And I jumped and I thought, as a rock hit our window or something? And there was the cockatoo stuck to the, 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 um, you know, the mesh on the window, stuck there, looking at us as if to say, where's my food? You're overdue. Um, God provides daily for your needs. That's the point. And if the birds survive, you are of much greater value to God. And your value is not bound up with who you are as a person so much as it is bound up with the image of God in you. God has created humanity as special. We are not like the animals. We are different to the animals. We have the ability to think, to rationalize. We have the ability to worship God. The animals don't. We are set apart from the animals. We are called to rule over the animals. And God has placed his image in us. And so our value is bound up with the image of God, even though that's a broken image because of sin. And then when you take that to another level, your value is bound up, if you are a Christian, in the fact that Jesus Christ has placed his life on you. In the sense that he has died for you. Your value is bound up in the value of the Lord Jesus Christ. God sent his son into the world to pay the penalty for your sin, to die on a cross for you. What love is this that God should do that? And so the value that is placed upon you is the value that is bound up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And since you are that valuable, God is able to provide. The second one is the length of life. Now, it's a really interesting way he puts this. Who of you, my warring, can and is, add a single hour to your life? Now, they've taken a bit of liberty in translating that, and they've probably got it right in terms of the flavor. That's not what it says literally. Literally, it says, who can add a cubit to their forearm? In other words, it's a measurement of height. Quite literally, Jesus is saying, who can actually, when they hit the adult, adulthood, who can actually grow any taller? I know that as you get older, you grow shorter, but I know that I don't know of anyone who's grown taller. Apparently, you need to measure yourself when you wake up in the morning because gravity pushes down on you, and if you measure yourself at the end of the day, you'll be about two centimeters shorter. So if you want to feel tall, measure yourself in the morning. Now, don't take my word for it. Go and experiment. It, 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 it actually is, works. And Jesus is saying, you can't get taller. In other words, you can worry about, am I going to get sick and die from COVID? Am I going to get sick from cancer? Am I going to end up having some debilitating disease? You can go through all these worries. Am, am I going to be in a car and be involved in an accident and lose my life? You, there's so many different things that you and I can become concerned about. And Jesus says to you, you cannot add anything to your life. Nothing. Before you were born, God in eternity decreed the day you would be born and the day you would die. And you will not change that. No matter what you try and do. Now, I know I've told this illustration before, and I said to Dennis Weekly before the service, I feel bad when I retell stuff. But this really brings out the, 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 the sense of it. You, you, you know the story of the merchant, the old legend of the story of the merchant, who sent his servant out into the markets in Damascus to go and buy some stuff. And, and while the servant was in the market, he was jostled, and he came home white and frightened, and he said to his master, while I was in the, in the market, 
I was jostled by someone, and I turned to look in the crowd to see who had jostled me, and I saw it was death that had jostled, jostled me. And he says to his master, please, can I borrow a horse so I can ride to Samaria to get away from death, that I might hide in Samaria, that death might not find me. A little later, the merchant went to the same market, and while he was busy in the market, he saw death, and he approached death, and he went to her, and he said to her, tell me, why did you jostle my servant and startle him so much and make that threatening gesture to him? And death said, I never jostled your uh, servant to scare him. I simply expressed surprise that he was here in Damascus when I had an appointment with him in Samara. You can't escape. You're not going to change your length of days. You're not. And whether God calls you home today, or whether it's next year, or in 10 years, or in 20 years. No one knows. Hebrews 9 verse 27 declares, it is appointed for man to die once, and then judgment. It is appointed. So why do we worry about whether or not we're going to make 50 or 60 or 70 or 90 or 100. Who cares? Live your life in the service of God to the glory of God in the present. And God will sort out the future. You don't have to worry about it. God's got it covered. The third has to do with the flowers and the grass. Here the point that is being made in that comparison with Solomon is that Solomon, out of all the kings, is the most extravagant of all the kings, has the most wealth and has the most uh, extravagant clothing and so on. And Jesus simply makes the point that the, the flowers don't spin or grow, uh, or don't spin or produce anything in and of themselves. but that God provides for them. They come and they go. Since God does all of this, how much more is he concerned about you? How much more is he concerned about ensuring that you are provided for, that your needs are met Now the question that immediately arises out of this text is this, if God provides for his children, if that's what Jesus says, what about the Christians who starve in the world? What about them? What about those Christians who die from starvation in poor countries around the world? If Jesus says, do not worry, God will provide. Has God's provision failed? Well, the short answer is, it's not addressed yet. But if we want to explore that a little bit further, we should ask ourselves the question as God's children, what does God say to us about caring for our destitute brothers and sisters around the world. Well, let me read Matthew 25. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I, uh, sorry, uh, yep, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, 
and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? You see the surprise? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? They're completely misunderstood. When did we see you sick or in prison or go and visit you? Now listen. The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least one of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Do you get it? Why do people starve who are brothers and sisters in Christ around the world because the church in the West that is so wealthy is not supplying their need? This is not a failure of God. This is a failure of God's people. Which then ups the ante, doesn't it? It puts an incredible responsibility on us to ensure that as much as is possible it's not always possible, I understand. But as much as it is possible that we continue to use the wealth that God has given us generously to help those who are destitute, who are starving in parts of the world, that are fellow believers in Christ. We have a responsibility before God to our brothers and sisters around the world. And we need to take that seriously. We have so much wealth. How are we feeding them? How are we clothing them? So Jesus then goes on to his disciples and he says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon is, skip forward to verse 30, uh, to verse 32 rather. For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. So Jesus says to them, instead of allowing yourself to get caught up in all these things that distract you, that you become so narrowly focused on your anxieties. Your dependence should be upon God. And so there's a sense in which he says to them, and he rebukes them very gently. He says, oh, you of little faith. It's the same word he uses in Matthew 8, 26, when they are in the storm and they're so frightened and they are, the boat is being buffeted and they get Jesus to come and calm the storm and he turns to his disciples and that in Matthew 8, 26, let me read it. He says, he replied, oh, you of little faith, oh, are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. And then his disciples say, what man is this? So it's the same word that is used there. Now, the point that is being made by Jesus is he's saying that the problem when you worry is that you transfer the focus from Jesus Christ onto yourself. You become self-absorbed, self-centered. And as a result of that, your faith is brought into compromise. One of the commentators put it like this. Worry is practical atheism and an affront to God. Let me repeat that. Worry is practical atheism and an affront to God. Now, that commentator is trying to bring out the force of that saying, oh, you of little faith, where Jesus is trying to say to them, you need to exercise your faith in resting in the provision of Jesus, you need to cast yourself at the foot of the cross, you need to relinquish your anxieties, and you need to hand them over to God, and you need to leave them there and not reclaim them. It's so difficult doing that, isn't it? Sometimes you and I, in our frailties, we, we go to God and then we take those anxieties back and it kind of goes in this back and forth manner. 
But to worry about such things is to fail to acknowledge God's provision. And that is in the essence or the root of the issue is a faith that is not robust enough to trust in spite of circumstances. A faith that is robust enough to say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to provide. I don't know how you're going to meet this need. I don't know from a human perspective if it's even possible when I look at all the possibilities that are laid out before me. But in spite of my lack of knowledge, Lord, I am going to relinquish this problem to you. I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm going to unburden it to you. And I'm going to leave it with you. And I'm going to trust that in your own way, in your own time, according to your own uh, sovereignty, you will eventually meet this particular need. Gee, that's hard, isn't it? It is. It's hard. But this is what Jesus is encouraging us to do. Unbelievers worry about these things because they are self-reliant, whereas the believer is Jesus-reliant. We don't rely on things in this world. We rely on Christ. And so if I can read some scriptures to you to encourage you. 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Philippians 4 19, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the glorious riches in Jesus Christ. Nam 1 7, Yahweh is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. Psalm 46 God is our, verse 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of need. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He who watches over you will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord watches over your coming and going. God is over you. So whatever your anxiety is, trust Him. Give it to Him. Leave it there. Someone wrote, to act out the principle of turning prayers over to God, we took a ba paper bag and wrote, this is a good idea, we wrote God on it and taped it up high on the back of our kitchen door. As I prayed about matters, such as my career, my role as a father, my abilities to be a good husband, I would write down each concern on a piece of paper, then those pieces of paper would go into the bag. The rule was that if you start worrying about the matter of prayer that you've turned over to God, you have to climb up on the chair and fish it out the bag. I don't want to admit how much time I spent sifting through those scraps of paper. Maybe it would be good for all of us to do that. Get a bag and write God on it. Write out the request. Pray about it. Put it in the bag. See how long you last. This is a wonderfully encouraging word from Jesus to his disciples. Because he understands life is full of anxieties. It's full of frailty. It's full of brokenness. It's full of pain. It's full of suffering. And he understands that these things can start playing upon us and rob us of the joy of our salvation, rob us of the joy of our relationship with Jesus, rob us of the fullness of our Christian experience with him, rob us of the fullness of life that he comes to bring us. He understands. And so his word to you this morning, stop worrying yesterday. Don't take it up again. Leave it. Leave it. Cast it on him. 
if it's your marriage, if it's your children, if it's grandchildren, if it's sickness, if it's finances, if it's an emotional issue you're struggling through, a past problem you're grappling with, give it to Jesus. Hand it over. He stands with outstretched arms. My yoke is light, he says. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Jesus will sort it out. Amen. Now, Father, we thank you for your word that reminds us that we should not worry. We are prone to worry. Sometimes anxiety is crippling for us. And so we pray that you would help us to take the words of Jesus and apply to whatever it is in its life that we are concerned about right now to leave it with you, to allow you to bear our burden. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing in closing that wonderful song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God our Father. Let's stand as we sing together.